Sisters and brothers in Christ, would you join your hearts with me in prayer? God, we trust that your spirit is already moving and at work among us. You've called us here. You've spoken to us through the words of scripture and song. You've heard our prayers, our confession. You've offered us your grace and forgiveness, even fellowship with you. Now through your spirit, would you continue to illuminate our hearts and our minds, that these words before us would be your words of life, your words of peace, and your words of hope. Amen. This evening I'll be reading from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. I'll read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even though if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your salvation, the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a curious phrase, I think, living hope. Living hope as opposed to what? Dead hope? Stagnant hope? Would such a thing even be hope at all? Our hope is living because Jesus Christ lives. But how can we envision this living hope? My doctoral supervisor, Paul Scott Wilson, often tells us about this time in his high school science class. One day, his science teacher pulled out the hand crank generator to demonstrate electric current. There were two poles connected to this generator, one positive, one with a negative charge. And the teacher held the two poles in his two hands. And someone began to crank the generator and it produced electricity. At first, nothing happened between the two poles. But gradually, the teacher brought these two opposites closer together. Suddenly, there was a loud pop as a spark of electricity jumped between the two poles. And as he brought them even closer together, a flowing, dancing current of energy lingered between the poles. I like to imagine that the surprise of the initial pop gave way to wide eyes and hushed excitement as the students listened in to hear the buzz of the current. And when the poles were held too far apart, the electricity just 
dissipated into the air or something. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> but that current, that flowing, dancing, seemingly living spark was only there when these two poles were held in proper tension. Now in this introduction section to the letter of First Peter, Peter, or someone writing in his name with a remarkably better grasp of the Greek language than your typical Galilean fisherman, but we'll just go with Peter. <laughs> He's describing what Dennis Edward refers to as the dynamic tension that Christians experience trying to live a life of joyful expectation of final salvation while facing suffering. Maybe we can think of it as Peter writing about two poles of the Christian life. Peter's writing to Christ followers throughout Asia Minor, some from busy urban centers, some from the rolling hills of rural Galilee or Galatia, some Jews, some Gentiles, who are all living in this tension between the two poles of suffering and joyful expectation. Now, the kind of suffering they were experiencing was probably not an official empire-sanctioned persecution, so much as it was more social alienation, slander, harsh treatment, and verbal abuse on a more local level. Their, their faith put them at odds with the social and religious norms of the neighborhoods. They were haters of humanity, atheists, some strange social club. Those were the charges. And there were rumors of sexual impropriety. I saw Timmy greet Claudia with a kiss, as if they were family or something more. Never mind those love feasts they always run off to. Who knows what goes on there? Timmy used to be such a good kid when he was younger before those Jesus followers got to him. And any hint of drought or trouble in the city could be blamed on those troublemaking Christians who refused to offer sacrifices to the gods of the city. Peter Davids writes that in the first century, this area of Asia Minor was particularly patriotic. By and large, people had fully embraced the cult of the emperor because back in the day, Emperor Augustus finally brought peace and an orderly government to the region. So any deviance from that intense patriotism, not least of all to the emperor who was worshipped as a god, was seen as a threat to the peace and security that they finally enjoyed. So when followers of a certain Jesus of Nazareth go around claiming that there is an unseen king, a revolutionary whom Rome had executed, but whom, so they claimed, the one and only deity had appointed to rule the world, well, it's not hard to imagine that that didn't sit well. That put them at odds with the social and the civic events where emperor worship was just kind of part of the parade. Peter is writing to people who know about this first pole of the Christian life that is suffering. You can also hear Peter writing to us. Christ followers gathered at Calvin University on this mild for Michigan January day some of us from busy urban centers, some from the frozen snow-covered fields of rural Ontario, believers gathered from across the globe from many different denominations who, like Peter's first listeners, continue to live in this tension between the poles of suffering and joyful expectation. I think today we still know something about this first Whole of the Christian life that is suffering. But for those of us who live in North America, I recognize that this talk of suffering for our faith is kind of loaded. On one hand, 
Christianity, or at least some streams of Christianity, have such enormous power on the national scale in the U.S. so that it's hard to see any distinction at all between the national civic religion and some expressions of the Christian faith. This has caused one commentator to question whether Peter's first audience would even recognize any similarities at all between their experience and ours. On the other hand, we might experience a kind of social alienation when people assume that we're a particular kind of Christian. I was at a nearby salon getting a haircut last week. I don't know if you can tell. (laughs) As I started talking with my stylist, she asked where I was from. I said, well, I live in a small town in Ontario, but I'm from around here. She asked, so what made you move to Ontario? I said, well, I'm going to school in Toronto. Oh, really? So what are you studying? I said, well, I'm studying uh, Christian theology and preaching. Well, that stopped the conversation. (laughs) (laughs) And I know what all you good missional people are thinking, which is that I blew it, like that was my chance, and I blew it, and you're probably right. Now, I wouldn't say that I suffered from my faith in that situation. That would be stating it much too strongly. An awkward pause in the conversation doesn't count as suffering for my faith. And yet, I am aware that to say I am studying Christian theology and preaching, much less to admit that I am a Christian preacher, may dredge up all kinds of not-so-great associations for the woman cutting my hair. Maybe you've had some not-so-great things assumed about you. Oh, you're a Christian, so you must be one of those people who bomb abortion clinics and picket the funerals of LGBTQ people. Probably it's not quite so extreme. Probably it's more just like, well, don't tell her about your messed-up family, your divorce, your problems, or any of your weekend plans unless you want to lecture about sinning. The situation in North America may not be exactly the same as what Peter's first listeners experienced, but I think we do know a little something of that kind of social alienation, maybe even slander in some cases. What's more, of course, there are many different experiences represented here. You may come from a place that knows much more clearly the kinds of various trials that the churches of the first century knew about. As sisters and brothers in Christ, we can grieve the many ways in which the body of Christ throughout the world continues to experience alienation, slander, harsh treatment, and even moving beyond that to physical abuse and violence and threat of death. We lament the recent kidnappings and the deaths of brothers and sisters in Nigeria. We also lament the church's tenuous position in China and the government crackdowns there. We're mindful of the many who lost their lives in the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka last year and the targeting of historically black churches in the southern U.S. that were set on fire last spring. Of course, this list is sadly not exhaustive. We can lament with all our brothers and sisters for whom faith in this unseen king puts them in danger or has caused ties to be broken. And I think we can also think of the various trials that Peter mentions as extending beyond just suffering for our faith. Our churches are packed with various trials. Of course, I don't need to tell you that. I mean, the woman who just lost her friend sits right behind the teen struggling with mental health, and he sits beside the elder who is concerned for the future of the church. She's just behind the couple whose relationship is strained to the point of breaking. Every week when you look out on your church, whether you're leading worship, preaching, sitting in the back trying to pay attention while a toddler crawls all over you, or anywhere in between, you are seeing a church that knows about various trials. It's against the backdrop of this suffering that God not only offers protection 
like Peter says, but also the promise of an imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance. In short, God offers salvation. This is the second pole of Christian living, joy in the salvation of God, which is sealed in the resurrection of Christ, and now at hand through the Holy Spirit, but still waiting to be revealed in all its fullness. God holds out this promise of an imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance. And just by the way, I'll note that there's wide agreement among contemporary commentators that what's often translated as the salvation of your souls in verse 9 should be understood just as the salvation of yourselves. I mean, the same word can be translated either way, soul or self. And since there's no indication here that Peter is purposely contrasting the body and the soul, we can understand him to simply be referring to the whole self. So, I think we can do away with any notion that the Christian hope for salvation in this passage, even in the present tense, has nothing to offer the suffering and burdened and broken bodies that inhabit our churches and our world. This inheritance will mean the resurrection of the body, the renewal of God's good creation, an abundant life in the presence of God. This would have been a vibrant message of grace to those new Christ followers who faced estrangement from their families. Their family inheritance was no longer on the table. They'd been written out of the will, so to speak. But God gives them a new birth into a new family, complete with a new inheritance that will not spoil or fade. As God draws this promise into the present, Peter's readers are assured that God is already now in the present acting to bring about the salvation of their whole selves. God brings their salvation into the present through their new community, through their acts of love done in service to the one who they love, and not least of all, through a living hope. When God brings these two poles of present suffering and the promise for salvation into tension with each other, a new third thing is generated. God ignites the spark of living hope. And this hope lingers as a dancing, humming, living current of God's spirit among us. So now we're back where we started. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Living hope. I think it's a curious phrase. It is living because Christ lives and because God ignites this spark in the dynamic tension between our present trials and joyful expectation for salvation. But it is living for the additional reason that it is an active kind of hope. God ignites this spark of hope and so puts us into motion. Just about one year ago, the young climate activist Greta Thunberg uh, spoke in Switzerland, where she offered what I think is a scathing review of hope. She scolded those in attendance for offering children hope for climate change when she said, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day, and then I want you to act. My point, hear me clearly, is not to undermine her activism, but to observe that Greta's indictment of hope as a kind of self-soothing coping mechanism or a cheery optimism without action does not describe the kind of living hope that Peter has in mind here. 
the kind of hope she seems to have in mind or the kind of hope maybe she has seen is decidedly not living at all. God's gift of this new birth into living hope calls forth action and worship. The dancing of the spark is the movement of God's spirit moving God's people. The hum of the spark is the voice of God's people in lament, in resistance, in joyful expectation, even in celebration of the one who will surely bring wholeness and life to our fractured and dying world. Over the last eight or nine years, some professors and students across the road at Calvin Seminary have been, uh, begun developing relationships with people down at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, or Angola, prison. Professors and students have visited to learn about the incredible movement of God's spirit in that prison. Professor John Rotman recently told me about a man he met there His name is Paul Will. And Paul Will helps us to see what it looks like for God to sustain that spark of living, active hope. Some years ago, Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, was visiting the prison and she got into a conversation with Paul and some of the other inmate pastors. Oh, Paul, she says to him, how do you do it? How do you work in this place with these people and no hope of parole? How do you walk outside with the fences and up and down the hallways with the gates and the bars and the dreary walls? How do you keep working for the Lord here in this place? It just feels so hopeless. Well, ma'am, Paul responds, we believe that hope is a person and we have fallen head over heels in love with him. Do you hear that spark coming between the two poles of Paul Will's trials of many kinds and his hope for an inheritance that includes abundant life with the one he loves? For Paul Will, this spark is not a kind of inanimate force or a vague life force. It is the very person of Jesus Christ now present through the Spirit. So tonight, Jesus promises that even as you suffer various kinds of trials, this inheritance, this resurrection, this renewed creation, this abundant life, communion with God, communion with others, is not only imperishable, undefiled and unfading, it is now also present as the Spirit brings about the salvation of your whole self. And so as we sing and lament and pray and work and praise together this weekend, we can even expect to get a glimpse of that dancing energy We can even expect to hear the buzzing current that is our living hope. This is the presence of God's spirit in our midst. This is our gift from God, who brings the promise for our inheritance into our present trials of all kinds through the resurrection of the one who we love, the firstborn from among the dead, who lives and reigns, together with the Father and Spirit, one God. To God be all praise and glory and honor, both now and forever. Would you pray with me? God of hope, who knows our suffering and trials of all kinds, thank you for this, the gift of your word. Help us now to receive what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you. Lord, ignite our hope. Send your spirit to put our feet in motion and draw us to you. We long for the day when Jesus Christ is revealed in glory, when heaven and earth are joined together and all is set right. 
Sustain us until that day by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.